Saying hello here in the studio to Tim Shaw, the Thailand correspondent for Seven Network Australia. He's joining me here on Lifestyle for some talk with listeners online, on Facebook, about some big events happening in Phuket this week and also something happening this weekend in your native part of the world. Is that correct? Abs- Good afternoon, Tim. Absolutely. It's great to have your uh, your studio at my disposal and I'm great to uh, glad to be here with you. We're going to have some fun the next couple of hours. We're going to look at some of the stories that have broken this week. Uh, of course, one of the big stories that I actually broke here on your program on Monday was that Larry Cunningham, the Honorary Consul for the Australian Government for Phuket, Krabi and Phang Na, was stepping down after a remarkable period in that role from mm-hmm. 2005 to 2007 and then, of course, formally from 2007 to 2013. Some big shoes to fill, Steve, and the question I've got for our listeners on Phuket's Live 89.5 is who do we think here in Phuket can fill those big shoes? What about you? I'm too <laughs> tall. I'm too tall and journalists aren't allowed. So that, <laughs> so that rules me out straight away. But of course, there is a big event happening in Australia in the Southern Hemisphere. And I wonder if any of our listeners might be in tune with it. It's where you have to go. That's right. Have to vote. Right. If you're on the Australian electoral roll, you are compelled to vote. We don't have voluntary voting like they have in the United States. And it'd be interesting to hear from our listeners on Facebook, on the Phuket News Facebook page. Send me an instant message. Do you remember which electorate you lived in? Because they've got 150 of them around Australia, Steve. Right. And it's like the council areas in England. You know, you vote for your councillors. Uh, We've got our local federal members, and they each have a federal seat. It'll be interesting to know. But People can vote here in Thailand in the Australian election. We'll tell everyone how they can do that. Something that's going to be very interesting, and particularly for those that have young Australian relatives, schoolies Mm -hmm. is a phenomenon. So at the end of their 12 years of formal education, they break loose. They do it on the Gold Coast, up there in Queensland. They've been doing it in Bali. And now, will they be here in Phuket? Schoolies 2013, is that going to be a good thing or a bad thing for Phuket? We're going to be talking about that. Sounds like a great event, if you ask me. (laughs) Well, it's interesting. I wonder if our listeners know what the legal age of drinking is in the Kingdom of Thailand. How old do you actually have to be to buy uh, an alcoholic drink? Okay, we'll find out a little bit more about that. And so much more here. We're teasing you right now. And if you'd like to get involved, please do. 076-612-895. We're with Tim Shaw, the Thailand correspondent for Seven Network Australia. And he's here with me on Lifestyle for the next two hours. You learn something new every day, Mr. Tim Shaw, who's here with me in the studio, and he's the Thailand correspondent for Seven Network Australia. He's here on Lifestyle today, talking about so many things. What have you got lined up for us then, Tim? Well, you know, at a quarter past one here on Phuket's Live 89.5 News Talk, um, proudly brought to us, by the, by the way, uh, by the Phuket News, by Phuket News TV, and the resources of the Seven Network Australia. You know, Steve, Australians go to the poll this Saturday and more than 12 million people will visit local schools, church halls and public buildings, which will pop up polling places right around Australia for this Saturday, the 7th of September 2013. Now, it's a legal requirement to vote whether you are in the country or not. So if you're visiting other countries like the Kingdom of Thailand, voting is compulsory and you've got to vote in the electoral area in which you live. But what happens if you are visiting the Kingdom of Thailand? Now, the Australian Embassy in Bangkok is providing a polling place for this Saturday's 2013 federal election. And joining us live on the line from Bangkok is Trudy McGowan, the electoral returning officer at the embassy to tell us what Australians need to do to cast their vote. Trudy, welcome to Phuket's Live 89.5. Thanks, Tim. It's very busy with voting at the moment, so I've, <laughs> I have to rush in and do this phone call. We are glad that you're able to make the time. Now, tell us, what does a returning officer do, Trudy? Well, as a returning officer here, I oversee the running of the election in Thailand. So uh, that, to do that, we make sure everything's fair and we do everything according to the Australian Electoral Commission rules. Um, everything has to be for example, the people who come in with the how to vote cards have to stand a certain distance away from the voters. Um, we make sure that everybody knows where to come to vote and what times they can come, and then we make sure all the ballots get back in time to be counted so we can find 
out who's the Prime Minister. Now, importantly, um, you've been open for pre-polling, which means you can vote prior to this Saturday. Now, how many people have already cast their vote at the Australian Embassy in Bangkok? Uh, we're up to over 800 as we speak now. I, we just had a little look. It was about 810, so... Now, Australian citizens that are living in uh, Bangkok or they're visiting Bangkok, what do they need to bring with them to be able to actually vote at the embassy uh, today, tomorrow, or even on Saturday? Best thing to bring is your passport. Um, everybody who's living overseas sh or travelling overseas should have their passport with them, and that's the best way we can assure who you are and that your identity is right. Now, is this the first time you've actually had to perform the role as returning officer? It is my very first time, so... Learning as we go. Now, you know, the last election was in 2010, the last federal election. Uh, were you there in Bangkok? And uh, how many people registered their vote at the embassy last time? And do you think you'll have even more this year? I wasn't here, but 1,950 people voted in Bangkok for the last federal election. Um, and judging from the amount of people who we've had so far, I would say definitely we're going to beat those numbers this year. I'm speaking with Trudy McGowan. She's the returning officer and also has another day job. She's the uh, head of consular services at the Australian Embassy in Bangkok. Now, this is a tough question, Trudy. There's 150 federal electoral boundaries known as seats. Now, my seat in Sydney is McKellar. Do you know what your seat is? Yeah, I think my seat is the, probably the easiest one in the country to remember. That's Canberra. Canberra. Would <laughs> It's the, one of the only ones that's actually named the same as the town that we live in. That's helpful. Canberra, of course, being the national capital for the Commonwealth of Australia. Now, there's two voting papers that voters have to consider. One's for the lower house of representatives. The upper house, the Senate, has got 76 seats. But it's only a half-Senate election in this election. Have the ballot papers arrived, of course, but they're so long, those big se uh, Senate ballot papers, aren't they? They are very long. They send them to us with some magnifying glasses. <laughs> Nobody's actually needed the magnifying glasses, but we do have them on hand if you come here and you're having trouble seeing, because there is a lot of people to choose from. Now, how long do you think it'll take? If I was voting in Bangkok this Saturday at the Australian Embassy for the federal election, how long do you think it'll take in the queue to register and then to vote this Saturday? I would hope that it wouldn't, wouldn't take any more than half an hour, but... We always can't predict how many people are going to be in the country at a time. Um, I would say lots of people like to do it in the morning, so if, you, if you're looking to get in and out quickly, the afternoon might be a better time. So what are we talking, from 8 till 6, same time as polling time in Australia? Actually, no, we're only required to be open from 9, and then we have to stay open until 6 p.m. in the last Australian polling place, which is WA, so that's 5 p.m. in Bangkok. So we're open 9 to 5. 9 till 5 this Saturday, and are they the same hours uh, today, tomorrow, and Friday if you want to pre-poll? Today, tomorrow and Friday is 8.30 till 4. 8.30 till 4. Tell our listeners who haven't had the pleasure of seeing the Australian Embassy exactly where you're located in Bangkok City. We're on 37 South Sutton Road. Uh, if you're going to use the BTS, you can come to Saladang BTS Station or Chong Nonsi, and it's a short walk from both of those. We're quite close to the Banyan Tree, which most people would know because it has a rooftop bar in it. Easy to identify. Now, Trudy McGowan, you're the returning officer for the 2013 federal election, but as I alluded to, it's not your regular job. What is your job at the embassy? So I'm, I'm the first secretary and consul, which means I'm the manager of the consular and passport section here. Um, the consular section in the embassy in Bangkok is the biggest consular section in the world, and we have the most consular cases in any other post-Australian embassy in so I'm running the day-to-day -day operations of that. So any Australians who get into trouble or have needs of any kind over here, we try and help them. If someone passes away or is arrested or sick, we help their families and we also look after passports and notarials. So all the people who find the love of their life in Thailand and want to marry them, they come to us to get their paperwork signed and things like that. This week has been a big uh, week for us here in Phuket with the announcement which I broke here on this program that uh, Larry Cunningham, the Australian Honorary Consul, after uh, serving from 2005 to 2013, uh, was stepping down from that role to focus on family and on business. They are big shoes to fill, Trudy. What kind of candidate are we looking for? Well, first of all, I have to agree with you, Larry. It has been a fabulous honorary consul, and they are very big shoes to fill. We're hoping that we'll find someone who, who might be ready to take on the task. 
We're looking for someone who is very familiar with Phuket, so ideally they would be living in Phuket at the moment, and the terms of an honorary consul are two years, so they need to be staying in Phuket for at least another two years. Um, the person needs to have a premises that they can work from, so um, you know any kind of a business or, or a home that is suitable for people to come and visit, um, and they have to be able to support themselves. So what we pay for people to be the honorary consul is a very small token. It's actually an honorarium. Um, it's, it's not something that you can live off, so we need the person who's the honorary consul to have their own job or income or, or some way to already support themselves. And of course, because you might know from seeing Larry around in the media, he's very, very busy and sometimes people will be calling in the middle of the night. So you have to be enthusiastic and, and I think you, everyone will say a trait that Larry had is really care about tourists and their safety and their well-being in Thailand. The important thing to know is that Larry has the most beautiful resort, the Chava Resort, uh, out there at Surin and of course will be remaining here and working here in Phuket with so many good friends and colleagues. But that's a very important point that this Australian citizen or someone who is closely linked with Australia ideally could speak Thai but it's not a minimum requirement. But it's an important thing to be able to be there for Australian families and individuals that really need assistance at certain times. Yeah, I think if we talked to many of the people who have assisted Larry over the years, they would say that he'd, he'd really made a difference. And part of, part of the fact that makes a good consular officer is when you genuinely care about the people. So Larry well and truly did that. So we'll be hoping to find someone else who, who really cares about Australians. And just finally, Trudy, for those wanting to get the application form and to know the criteria, is at thailand.embassy.gov.au where they can have a look? That's right. That's the best place to go um, for the application. But you can also look on um, DFAT. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, they, they jokingly say in Australia, vote early, vote often. But of course, only one vote is all you're allowed to cast in the 2013 federal election. Trudy McGowan, thank you for your time. Okay, you're welcome, Tim. Bye. Thanks. I've been really looking forward to this day. It's my final week here on the air at Live 89.5. And uh, this guy has been a breath of fresh air since he's arrived on these islands. And we've uh, got him in the studio to talk generally about everything. And with the uh, election coming up in Australia, that was a good opportunity to drag him into the studio and have a little chat. We're talking about Tim Shaw, the Thailand correspondent for the Seven Network in Australia. And he's here with me this afternoon on Lifestyle. Now, sadly... Before we go any further, you do have some breaking news, don't yeah, you, Tim? we do have some breaking news. In fact, Steve, Ariel Castro. Now, this was the man that held three women captive in his Cleveland home in the United States for nearly a decade, has been found dead at a state prison facility. And this has come through uh, from the sydneymorningherald.com.au website. Now, the spokespeople from the prison facility indicated that Mr Castro, 53, was found in his cell at about 9.20pm on Tuesday, uh, Australian Eastern Time uh, today, and uh, 12.20 Australian Eastern Time today, which is about 9.20am this morning, at the Correctional Centre in Orient, Ohio. Now, prison medical staff performed CPR before Castro was transported to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. Uh, Castro is believed to have taken his own life, and for those of us that do remember the horror of this story, imagine three little girls that mm. had been snatched from the streets upon which they had lived. This Castro man living with at least one, if not two, brothers held these girls prisoners for that period of time. In fact, um, uh, at least one of the uh, young girls, as she matured, bore this man children. So just repeating this breaking news, that Ariel Castro, who had held three women captive in his Cleveland home in the United States for nearly a decade, has been found dead at a state prison facility in the United States, and the correction officers have indicated that he has taken his own life. It's Pickett's Live 89.5. Good afternoon to you, Steve, on Lifestyle with Tim through until 3 o'clock this afternoon. We'd like you to get involved. Please do. 076-612-895. Or, if you want, you can go to our Facebook page, which is, of course, the Phuket newspaper, and add comments on there, because I've teased you a little bit, because we're talking about the up-and-coming Australian general election, amongst many other things this afternoon here with Tim. 
And we've got a couple of comments already, which I shall read out very shortly. But you've got a lot going on, haven't you, sir? Yeah, and look, a couple of interesting things that I do want to get uh, our listener feedback on. Um, There's been an issue about the taking of prescription drugs, not only here in Phuket, around Thailand, but the increased use of Xanax and Valium. And that's one of the subjects that we want to talk about today is you and I might go down and have a long lemonade with some ice or maybe a cold, cold San Miguel. With an orange juice? At the panache. Yeah, no, we could have an orange juice. Why not? But what people seem to be doing is taking so many risks with substances and substance abuse. And I'd love to get our f- listeners' feedback on uh, 76 or on the Phuket News uh, Facebook page. What do we need to do? Is it education for the younger folk? Or are we in a situation where people just aren't getting that high and that hit as they used to, and they're now going to prescription drugs, some of which may not have been properly manufactured? We'll talk more about that here on Lifestyles with Tim Shaw and Steve Johnston. Who gets live at 89.5? Gordon Sumner, known as Sting. Gordon used to be a teacher in a school in Newcastle. Then he decided to set up a band called The Police. They all dyed their hair blonde, and the rest, they say, is complete history. Great song. Uh, talking about dyeing hair blonde, we have Tim Shaw, the Thailand correspondent. Hang on a minute. For Are the you... Seven Network Australia. Hang on a minute. Studio. Are you telling me that that band dyed their hair blonde? They did, all of them. So you're telling me, you're telling me that the drapes did not match the carpet. Exactly. And it done them the world of good completely. And also, if you think about it, he's still looking pretty good these days, Sting in his 50s, looking the part. I reckon a bloke at 50 plus that's got that much money can have the most beautiful women and woman in the world. And you look at David Bowie, of course, with of course. his beautiful wife, Amant. We look at Sting and his wife's name is... I've forgotten. Uh, Trudy. Trudy. Trudy Star. Yeah, yeah Trudy Star. That's Beautiful right. Beautiful yeah. woman. Yeah. Um, and we look at Jerry Hall. I mean, why Mick Jagger let Jerry Hall go? And do you know she's in Melbourne at the moment in Australia playing that sexy seductress in the Melbourne stage production of The Graduate. What a great show and film that was. But that's a story for another day. We've had some feedback <laughs> from our listeners on Phuket's Live 89.5. Throw it at me. Yeah, we're talking about the up-and-coming Australian general election, which is happening this week. So I put a posting on our Facebook page. Are you interested? A couple of good feedbacks here, and please do some more on our Facebook page if you want to. First off, I'll go with um, something that I was thinking about myself when you told me earlier on. Uh, This has come from Graham, who's a Brit like myself. He says, what happens if... The Aussie doesn't vote because you did say they have to vote, didn't you? Yeah, it's compulsory to vote in Australia, and it's a really good question, Graham. A automatic $50 fine is issued to the residential address of the person that did not vote. That's what the Australian Electoral Commission does. Now, can anyone believe this? Over 700,000 registered Australian voters in the 2010 federal election failed to vote easy money 35 million dollars <laughs> in fine but the reality of it is it's your democratic right to do it and a lot of people get upset about being told they have to do it that's why a lot of people love living in thailand and in phuket yay i'm away from my government they can't tell me what to do anymore but then there's the other side if you don't take part if you don't play in the game you can never win it can you well it's interesting because we'll we'll lead on to an, another issue here as come through by cliff who made a posting he says sadly a lot of people are more interested in things like football or tv cooking shows uh, and more than you know a third of their money each week goes obviously on spending it towards the government and he said the apathy is appalling yes and then they do nothing about it but complain about the government so that's the spin-off there isn't it absolutely you've got to be part of the process and i think in the united states let's use uh, president obama's first term as an example the use of social networking twitter and facebook got president obama elected mm-hmm. how because of the rise in the number of people that are spanish speaking In the United States, in fact, literally more people speak Spanish as their first language than they do English in the United States. President Obama's team harnessed that power of the people through instant messaging, Facebook and Twitter. It happened at the right time for him, didn't it, really? Correct. And so, in a way, he was an outsider. He said recently, Steve, which was something I'd love our listeners' feedback on, he said, 
I'm tired of being judged by the colour of my skin. And he said, when I was 17 or 18, they used to look at me in the shopping mall and they'd look from toe to, to, uh, to top to see whether, you know, why is this guy here? And I think there's been a little bit of that empowering of people that are a little different, that look different, different coloured skin. And I think that's been part of the success of the Obama election Mm -hmm. um, over certainly in the last election as well. But he was talking about a particular young man, Trayvon Smith, who unfortunately was killed by a weapon, um, someone believing they had the right to defend themselves. The gun culture in the United States is bad, but, you know, people tell me here there are people carrying guns in Phuket that shouldn't be. So mm. do we need to get back to that old face-up, fisty fight, or do we need to walk away? And I saw a lovely piece the other day about a strong man the stronger the man, the man that walks away, mm -hmm. walks away from that kind of dispute. Interestingly enough, talking about the the apathy a little bit there, what Cliff was saying, yep. uh, and from a, a general election point of view, uh, I want to try and tie a couple of things together here. Because, for instance, if, you, if you're not there, it doesn't bother you. So really, why should I be interested? And I sort of watched a report earlier this week about the same kind of thing happening in Syria with all the problems that poor part of the world is having. Uh, obviously, Middle East is always a, a hot pot anyway, never matter what country you're in. But um, I was watching a program where Syrians who live abroad are living away yes. don't really care. It's an interesting point, and I think that um, the basket case, that is the Middle East, and there are many Australians that were dead against the Howard government sending our troops to fight in Iraq. This is not our war. And there were those people that pay taxes and votes saying to our government, don't do this. I understand why some Syrians are saying, I'm so glad I don't live in Syria anymore. And so we now have 44 million refugees around the world. I'll say that number again, 44 million refugees. And not only in the Australian federal election this week is the whole boat people and refugee issue right up there in the top three or four reasons why I will vote for you or I won't. But David Cameron's Conservative Coalition government had exactly the same thing in the United Kingdom. This is a global issue, and sadly, we even have that issue here in the Kingdom of Thailand with the Rohingya and those fleeing and leaving Myanmar. So it's a global issue. It's a global responsibility. Steve, where is the bloody United Nations? Mm -hmm. You know, here we are. Uh, the Americans are talking about getting congressional support for strikes in Syria now against the Assad regime. Where's the United Nations? Mm -hmm. Where is the, peace, the peacekeepers? Where are those blue berets that used to be there as part of that United Nations program? We spend all this money and these idiots sit in an ivory tower in New York City. Lovely place. Maybe we should get the United Nations down here in Phuket. That would be good for the economy. Interesting. Uh, I've worked within countries that use the United Nations. I've worked in the Balkans as part of British Forces Broadcasting Service. And I was in uh, Kosovo and Pristina. Yes. And uh, the interesting theory that the locals had that um, the United Nations provide them with a job, the local. And what he was saying is, as long as we've got trouble here, they're always going to be here. Yeah. So for, from a draining point of view, but I understand exactly what you're saying. In fact, there was more white Land Rover United Nation r r Land Rovers on the road than the, what there were normal cars. Mm. It, it is, it's a difficult one, no matter where you are and which part of the world. Do you know what President Clinton did at the time? And I just want to throw this open to, again, our, our American, our British and Australian listeners I interviewed a man called Dr. Serge Trifkovich, and I'll never forget his name, Steve. He was from the Balkan Institute of Studies in somewhere in Oklahoma City uh, in the United States. He referred to the then US President Bill Clinton as a crypto Marxist fascist. Really? And I, you know, literally had to walk away from the microphone to get the dictionary to, de <laughs> to define the crypto Marxist fascist. Bill Clinton went in without UN sanction without the support of the UN. So is the United States government the big brother? Are they the ones? Are they the world's protector? And I don't think so anymore. I think there needs to be better diplomatic discourse to be able to ease the tensions that we're hearing and seeing in Syria. 
Interestingly enough, it's uh, one of the big talking points of what's happening at the Australian general election this week. Uh, and we're going to come back and talk a little bit more with Tim Shaw, who is the Thailand correspondent for Seven Network in Australia. Who gets live at 9.5, 13 minutes past two o'clock. And it is 12 minutes past uh, two o'clock and applications are invited for the position of Australia's honorary consul based in Phuket with consular responsibility for the provinces of Phuket, Krabi and Phang Na. We spoke earlier with Trudy McGowan about the importance of being able to understand the role, the right person for the role, and she certainly is asking people to apply for this very, very important job. Well, what about if we actually talk to the bloke that's been doing the job for the last eight years? Larry Cunningham is ending eight years as Australia's first honorary consul on Phuket, and he's made a call for Thailand to make the popular holiday island a corruption-free model for the whole country. Larry Cunningham joins us now live. Hi, Larry. Hi, Tim. Look, I'm really well, and in the short time you and I have known each other personally, uh, I have just r reflected upon the work that you've done every day, uh, certainly in the time I've known you, but just take us back briefly over the last eight years, the kind of work that you've had to do representing Australia and assisting Australian citizens. Well, it's probably relevant to note that when I was appointed consul in early 2005, after the Australian tsunami, we had an average of 3,000 Australians in Phuket on any one day. Uh, not too many expats living here, uh, not too many tourists coming. Today, there's 25,000 Australians in Phuket, uh, about two and a half to 3,000 expats and anywhere from 20 to 25,000 tourists on any one day. So you only need a small percentage of those people to have a problem and there's a substantial amount of work that needs to be done. A very concerning story published in the Australian newspapers about, quote, Phuket is the most dangerous place in the world for Australian tourists. When you read that headline, what did you think? Well, unfortunately, the headline is correct if you look at it in terms of straight statistics. Uh, the fact is we have more Australians killed in Thailand uh, than in any other... Uh, more, I'm, I'm sorry, more Australians die in Thailand than in any other country uh, of the world. Uh, Phuket in particular, uh, we have on average one Australian death a week. Uh, you compare that to Bali, which has more tourists than Phuket, but has less deaths. Um, Bali last year, I think, was 39. So unfortunately, the, the statistics would say that, um, that, that it is correct, that uh, it is a dangerous place. Death by misadventure or death through actions that could have been prevented? Well, I think um, uh, of the 50 deaths a year, on average, it's normally a 50-50 split. There's half uh, people who die of natural causes while on holidays. Unfortunately, we had a 51-year-old lady overnight or yesterday who passed away. And then the other half are the ones that you really concern you, the misadventure. You know, it's, it's motorcycle accidents, it's... Um, uh, misadventure. I mean, the young kid that comes home at uh, four o'clock in the morning and is staying in a four-storey guest house and forgets that his key is locked in the room, so climbs onto the roof and thinks I'll slide onto the roof and go in via the balcony and then falls. Um, we have, unfortunately, a number of suicides, drug overdoses, etc. But uh, the misadventure, uh, not too many drownings. Aussies are pretty good swimmers, uh, but uh, we have had our share of drownings as well. Larry Cunningham, when we think about um, so many Australians love coming to Thailand, the land of smiles, um, the campaign Amazing Thailand, there are people here that are very welcoming of Australian tourists as they are of tourists from all over the world. Do we as Australians and those that we know coming here need to send a clear message to them about what to do and what not to do whilst they're visiting the kingdom? Now, this is something that I think really concerns um, the Australian authorities because, uh, you know, one of the major problems that we've had here, not so much with deaths, but with, um, uh, with extortion, has been the jet ski scam. Now, um, for, after me consistently pushing and pushing and pushing, several years ago, we actually, the jet ski scam actually made it onto the travel advice. But the number of times I've gone down to Patong Beach and tried to sort out the young kids from being extorted by these thugs um, and ask them, have you read the travel advice? They say, what travel advice? 
So I know the Foreign Affairs Department are working on a number of different things to try and convey this message. Uh, I recently did a video for the um, Foreign Affairs Department talking about the problems that you face when you come here. I think Aussies in particular, we're, we're generally laid back, we've got the she'll be right attitude and so on, but um, maybe we need to change that when we come overseas because um, to give you an example, the, uh, when the Australian Armed Forces come here for their R&R, for their &R, uh, I'm not involved because um, the Australian Armed Forces have their own um, MPs who you know, look after them and, um, in the case of anything going wrong. But they are forbidden, clearly forbidden, to ride any motorised equipment whilst they're in Phuket. So that immediately reduces the chances of any uh, deaths and also any problems with extortion if they're not riding jet skis or riding motorbikes. It's a very important message. I spoke to a young Australian today, Larry Cunningham, who does not have an Australian motorcycle licence but rented a motorcycle here. He did have health insurance, but as a result of having an accident on that high-powered motorcycle, he has had to pay for all his medical expenses here in Phuket. And furthermore, he would say he's being extorted to the tune of five and a half thousand Australian dollars for the damages caused to the bike. Do we say to a tourist like that, serves you bloody right? Or does the honorary consul have a role in assisting this young man? Well, I mean, if the, if the situation was reversed, if somebody wanted to hire a motorbike one in Australia, they would need uh, a motorcycle driving licence. So, you know, we need to take some of the blame ourselves. You know, if you hand your passport over to somebody, to a jet ski operator, to a motorcycle hire, you are just setting yourself up to be extorted. Uh, these guys will hold that passport. If you bring the motorbike or the jet ski back, whether there is real or imagined damage, you're put in a position where you are held to ransom by these guys. And these guys know very well. They'll say, come on, you've got to give me 30,000 baht for the damage. You're going back to Australia tomorrow, yeah, what's a thousand dollars? It's one week's salary. You don't go back tomorrow, maybe you lose your job. They know all these things to say to them. They're professionals at it and do it. But there should be some common sense by our people as well. Do not hand your passport over to anybody. Do not under any circumstances do that. You put yourself in a, in, in, in a position where you are, you're setting yourself up to be extorted. Several years ago, um, we had a young, well, not a young guy, he was in his late 20s, came off his motorbike in Patong, his helmet flipped off, he banged his head on the, on the pavement, fractured skull into the ICU at Bangkok Phuket Hospital, you know, looking after him and so on. Um, he was there for several weeks. The hospital bill was $60,000. I was in the room visiting him when the call came in from the insurance company in Australia. Yes, uh, Mr Cunningham, we're happy to cover the, um, uh, cover the cost of his hospital stay. All we need is a photocopy fax to us of his Australian motorcycle driving licence. I put my hand over the phone and asked him, did he have an Australian motorcycle licence? And he did not. His poor dad, uh, a civil servant in Canberra, just about to retire, had to take a $60,000 mortgage out on his house to pay the hospital bills. These are the stories that you've been hearing over the last eight years. And, you know, I, as an Australian journalist, um, of course, in the case of travel agent Michelle Smith, this was a great tragedy, not just for her, her friends, the family, but I guess a wake-up call for all Australians. Now, Larry, I read the same newspapers you do. We have shootings, we have stabbings in Sydney, in Melbourne. But what extra vigilance do all tourists, British, European, Australian tourists, need to exercise when they're holidaying, not just in Phuket, not just in Thailand, but in Asia? Well, I think you've got to be aware. The world is a change place. You can't go on holidays anymore and think everything's fine, there's going to be no problem at all. You know, the world is a changed place. You have to be aware of that. What you say is correct. I mean, I'm like you, I'm a Sydney sider. I wouldn't walk down George Street any night after midnight, probably not even after 10 o'clock. Uh, there are parts of Melbourne, you know, that are no-go zones. I mean, this does happen all around the world. Unfortunately, here, we tend to let our guard down more. We think we're right, we think we're on holidays. Now, schoolies is a prime example. Schoolies in Australia, 
you have the toolies following the schoolies. For your listeners that don't know, the schoolies are the kids that finish high school. They go away to the Gold Coast normally to celebrate their end of year. They get drunk for the first time, etc., etc., etc. But they're preyed upon by toolies. Toolies are sort of, you know, 25 up who sort of hang around hoping to pick up a young chick. OK, it's a bad scene. The full moon parties in Phuket have the schoolies and have the toolies as well. But the toolies at the full moon parties are very, very, very more dangerous, much more dangerous than any toolies in Australia. We have horrendous sexual assault. We have horrendous robbery. We have horrendous drug overdoses and so on at these full moon parties because people drop their guard. They think everything's fine and they drop their guard. And when we've got Australian travel writers writing that you have to do a full moon party, it's one of the main things that you need to do encouraging this type of behaviour. I just shake my head. I want to talk about Phuket in the future because your future is still here in Phuket. Your magnificent the Chava Resort is a fantastic location. You are still remaining here with your business activities and also focusing on family. But can you just tell us what you think the new Phuket is and should be, Larry Cunningham? Well, I think Phuket presents an ideal opportunity because of its geographical location, an ideal opportunity to... Uh, make it a prime example of how to overcome corruption. Now, too many ties accept that corruption is a way of life. They don't, and they always want to compare themselves to Singapore. You know, presently there's just daylight between Phuket and Singapore. But Singapore, 50 years ago, was a very corrupt place. Unfortunately, Thailand does not have a Lee Kuan Yew to sort of knock it into shape in one generation. But Phuket could be a start. You know, the fact that DSI is down here promising so much to um, eliminate some of the massive problems we have down here is a start. But I think Phuket could be a, it could be the start, it could be the new start. Now tourism, for example, um, as I've mentioned before, the problem we've had with trying to convince the authorities in Bangkok that things are bad in Phuket and need improving has been the fact that tourist numbers keep increasing. Unfortunately, this is a numbers uh, scene looked upon by them where you're looking at uh, quantity rather than quality. You know, all the, all the resorts prefer the European tourists. They prefer the European tourists because they generally stay longer, they spend more money, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not the two and three day stays, you know, that a lot of the Chinese, Indian and Russian tourists do, you know, that are people coming in there. So um, it, is, um, it is something that we, we could improve Phuket, but most of these people have stopped coming because they read online, they read the stories about poor water quality, about the corruption. A lot of them have experienced Phuket, have experienced being abused or insulted by a tuk-tuk driver, have been extorted by police or um, jet ski operators. These stories, with the world now, with the internet, just go everywhere, and people are completely aware of this, and they, um, you know, it stopped them coming. Now, if we, you know, I've been criticised for by some Thai authorities for being critical of Phuket. Now, the reason I have been is that you, first of all, must acknowledge that a problem exists. If you do what the authorities have been doing for the last 10 years and just sweep all the problems under the carpet and pretend they're not there, you know, the place will eventually turn on itself and collapse. This is what is happening. By bringing these problems out, it gives the authorities the opportunity to solve the problems. Now, if the DSI can solve some of these problems, well and good. I mean, why, for example, does Phuket have a, a transport system, a taxi system that is six times the cost of Bangkok? Uh, you know, why are these jet ski operators allowed to operate with impunity, as they have done for the last 10 years? Everyone's got stories to tell. You do the right thing by somebody, they go back home and tell three or four people. You do the wrong thing, they go and tell a hundred. But Phuket presents an opportunity if they solve some of these problems, the TAT could then market Phuket separate from Thailand as the new Phuket, as the new Phuket. You know, buses from the airport, which is a start. Taxi fares now, you know, far less than before. You know, a strong police presence, you know, no preferably no jet skis at all, but at least, you know, monitoring full insurance of jet skis, etc., etc. Uh, these are the things that could improve Phuket immeasurably, and it could be an example for the rest of Thailand. I want to ask you one final question. Someone listening to this program right now, she or he's contemplating applying for the role of honorary consul for the Australian government here in Phuket, Krabi and Phang Nhat. What would you like to say to those people? First of all, I would like to say to them, please apply. Check the criterion. Uh, it's probably wise to say don't waste your time unless you're willing to accept phone calls at 2, 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning. 
uh, don't waste your time if you um, uh, cannot you know um, have a relationship with people where they trust you but don't think you can't do it um, you know I had no training no formal training apart from life training when I when I was appointed as consul and I took over as consul uh, in in the eight years and you know I, I think I've done a pretty fair job and you know you can learn there, there's a lot of support from the embassy in Bangkok there's some wonderful wonderful people up there one of who you interviewed today um, who have you know who are just so supportive of you of you down here they're, they're only a phone call away you know you can get on them they can help you but you need to be in a position unfortunately where the role of what, that I, what, what I was originally appointed to just grew immeasurably you know I'm one of the few honorary consuls in the world that can renew passports for example you know we do the retirement visa stamps here you know we we do um, a lot of other things here that you know other honorary consuls don't do so you, you need to be able to sort of look at so, um, being uh, having an office set up of some sort where you could interview people. Normally speaking, most people coming in for an interview or, uh, for a passport renewal or a visa and so on is fine. Unfortunately, you'll also need a privacy area because there'll be some times when you're dealing with a rape case, for example, where, you, where you're going to need privacy and different things. Uh, and you'll need some sort of support, some sort of support with your staff. Now, um, you know... I'm lucky in the situation that I've had. My Thai staff have been wonderful. You know, they translate all the police reports that come in each day. A lot of the times when the police contact you, they don't speak at all English. Uh, my Thai's okay, but it's not good enough to speak with some of these police, so they've helped there. But, you know, don't be put off by the fact that you don't think you can do it. Um, if you, if, you know, you, you, if, if you're... If you're ethical, if you feel I've got to be careful what I say here because I don't want to be revving myself up. Huh. But if you if you feel that you know you you have the ability to try this and you would like to do it, but you've got to have the facilities as well. You might be you know a trained psychologist living in your in your private house with no facility for the passports or the visas. You won't be able to get the job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you, re you really would need to have facilities in place for it. Uh, generally speaking, you know, someone like in a, in a law firm, an accounting firm, uh, uh, you know, um, a real estate firm even, uh, something, someone like that. I mean, I've got a couple in mind, uh, a couple of people in mind that I know, and one of them you know as well, that yes. would be ideal, yes. whether he's got you know, the facilities in place for that. So, but please, if you feel you want to try, there's nothing to stop you, um, you know, setting out your resume, sending it off, um, the, the, all the information's in the local newspapers as well now that you can you can apply for it. So you know, don't be don't be dissuaded. And and please, I will be in Phuket at least six months of the year. And whoever is appointed here will have my number and my email address. And, and you know, I'm only a phone call away if ever you need any assistance. Well, there's two things I want to say. You and I have got our fans and our critics, but I think I speak for a lot of people that I've certainly uh, met and spoken with in the last days, weeks, and months. Uh, on behalf of everyone that you've assisted, on behalf of the Phuket community, uh, Australian, British, European expats and Thais alike, Larry Cunningham, thank you for eight years' service and we look forward to being able to enjoy your company with maybe a little bit more time in hand and a couple of cold beers down at the Aussie pub watching those bloody Australian wallabies beat those palms. Well, I hope we're going to be... I think, I think we'll have to be drinking for a long time. <laughs> it happen, mate. Larry, I know you've got a lot on and you're here in the job uh, to the 30th of September. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to Phuket's Live 89.5. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Tim. Larry, just one more question. This is Steve here. Um, Tim said you've got big shoes to fill. Uh, can I say, ask you what size feet you are? I'm sorry, say that again, mate. This has been a terrible long. I'm sorry, mate. Uh, what size feet are you? You've got big shoes to fill, apparently. 13 triple E's. All right, they are big. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, mate. Larry Cunningham, it is. Lifestyle with Tim Shaw, Thailand correspondent for Seven Network Australia. And it is great to be here and the company we've been able to have, we've been sharing some instant messaging on our Facebook page and uh, something I didn't mention to Larry Cunningham in my, in my interview with Larry was that I'm, I've known uh, the Foreign Minister of Australia, Bob Carr, for more than 15 years and in fact I sent a tweet to the Honourable Bob Carr, Foreign Minister of Australia, and said, Bob, we have lost one of our best okay. today. I haven't had a response from the Honourable, <laughs> right. the Honourable Bob Carr, Foreign Minister. He's got a little thing called an election that yeah. he's part of trying to win, but Phil has sent us a note on Facebook. Larry Cunningham has been a tireless honorary consul 
who has more than earned the pittance he is paid by the Australian government to look after Aussies in trouble here in Phuket. Finding a replacement of Larry's calibre will be no easy task. And Phil says here, good luck, Larry, and thanks for your hard work as the Honorary Consul for Australia here in Phuket. Nice endorsement there. Thank you, Phil. Uh, we were talking earlier on about the situation around the world, not just uh, with problems here. And uh, we had Graham talking to us a little bit earlier on about the, the UN situation, because mm. you mentioned about the UN uh, sort of uh, passed the bucking a little bit in certain parts of the world. And he's put on the UN don't have the... Um, how can I put it this way? Uh, testicles for this Balls, kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. Everyone blames countries like the US for bypassing the UN, but I'd rather the US put their force behind the UN and make it work as opposed to working around it. He says it's a bit of a tough one, but then he can't imagine Ban Ki Moon lasting long on Friday on Bangla Road, which is an interesting point <laughs> itself. Now, I want to bring it back to, <laughs> I want to bring it back to what's happening in the Australian general election, because you mentioned uh, the last time uh, it was uh, Howard that was, uh, had to make the big decision. Yeah. Do you think this is a big part of what could happen? I tell you what is happening, not only in Australia but in Britain. Many voters, every time they do decide that they have to vote or they want to vote, what's in it for me? They've got their hands out. Well, guess what? The British government is broke. <laughs> the Australian government is broke. We have had successive governments spend, spend, spend. But it's interesting you ask me about the whole issue of what is the trust factor for the Australian voter this Saturday in the federal election. It's about the economy. It's about parental leave. It's about trust in the leadership. And at this point, Kevin Rudd, who came back to the leadership after having been deposed by and uh, with Julia Gillard and the so-called faceless men. Well, Ms Gillard is no longer Prime Minister. Kevin Rudd has been back in the job for about seven weeks. We saw a big bump in the polls upward, but that has slid very significantly. Tony Abbott, uh, 53, lives at Balgowla in New South Wales, very near Manly Beach, member of Queenscliff Surf Club, runs around in his budgie smugglers, as we <laughs> call them. But the reality is, is he fit to lead? That's the kind of question the Australian voter is putting to themselves over the next 72 hours. But the issue that Tony Abbott believes in, and this is very much here in Thailand as well, is the, the emerging success of our Thai business women. What Tony Abbott's saying in Australia is, I want Australian women to have the full access to the workforce that they desire, and he's offering a very generous paid parental leave, where a working mum could be paid up to six months of her annual salary to a certain cap, so that she with confidence can create a family with her partner but feel confident enough to go back to the Australian workforce. He's no dill. He's no idiot mm. on this subject because every time you get a good worker, male or female, in the workforce, guess what they do every week, Steve? They pay tax. So more taxpayers in the Australian economy, according to Tony Abbott, is something that he believes needs to happen. Earlier on, on our Facebook posting here at Phuket's Live 89.5, uh, Cliff brought up the subject that apathy people not interested now what he's doing there he's trying to get the interest back in it because it's it's probably that age group that have got to the stage that, oh i've heard it all before i mean are you guys any different and not just in australia it's it's around the world and, and he's trying to encourage uh, that vote to work for him isn't he i was speaking with jason wilder at uh, we had a quick lunch and we we're talking about the whole power of the people to vote online um, instant messaging, the capacity to be able to participate in protest online. And one particular issue, and this is where Cliff's right, but you don't have to be apathetic. You can do it on your iPad, you can do it on your computer, you can do it on the telephone here or on Facebook, is you can have your say. And you'd be surprised who's reading your messages. Now, recently, a big complaint by the Murdoch press. Rupert Murdoch is a global media owner. He owns some 70% uh, of the newspapers in Australia, but about 35% of the readership. And an organisation called GetUp decided to make a TV commercial saying, Mr Murdoch, you're an American citizen now. You're not an Australian citizen. You don't need to tell us how we can or need to change a government. So people can be vocal. You don't have to be apathetic. 
and you can be participatory in the debate. Something that I think is important that IBAP, which is the International Business Association of Phuket, is promoting is the fact that female entrepreneurship here in Thailand is growing. And uh, Ms. Ulrich Gerlich, who is a lecturer and researcher at the School of Entrepreneurship and Management at the Bangkok University, is actually coming down here to Phuket on the 13th of September. She's a classic example of what didn't happen 30 or 40 years ago. There were not female lecturers and researchers in universities. What uh, Ulrich will be talking about is how more Thai women in this society are saying, do you know what? I can mm. go to university. I can run a business. I can be an entrepreneur. Tony Abbott's saying a very similar thing too. To be fair to Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister, he has changed his mind on same-sex marriage. And he said on Australian television on Monday, do you know what? The love that two people have with each other doesn't have to be based on gender. It's mm. about the right to love who you want. Now, he's gone completely 380 degrees. He's looking for a rush, though, isn't he? Yeah, that's the cynic's view. <laughs> but just quickly, too, and, you know, Larry Cunningham uh, raised this, a very, very important subject. These schoolies, you heard him talking about this issue of young kids blowing off steam, having finished their time, going to those full moon parties, the excessive consumption of alcohol, but something, Steve, that is really concerning authorities, both Thai and and consular authorities and particularly diplomats is the increased use of xanax and valium as a party drug now i didn't know about xanax until i started doing some research but it belongs to a group of drugs called the benzodiazepines it works by slowing down the movement of chemicals in the brain and it, that may become unbalanced it results in a reduction in nervous tension so you feel suddenly whoa now if we had mums and dads in Australia listening, some of which are listening to us live on 89.5 Phuket's live on the PhuketNews.com right now, are going, don't go to Thailand, don't go to schoolies on the Gold Coast, I'm worried about you taking drugs. Well, these kids are going, yippee. Mm, that's so right. we've got now an increased use of Xanax and Valium, not just in Thailand, but all over the world as part of a recreational drug use. What do we need to stop it? Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, in the 80s, I was um, DJing in a lot of the rave places when it started, 80s and 90s into the warehouses. And um, the same kind of epidemic kicked in in the UK. Now, uh, those particular people are now parents, children of their own. Yes. Because it's 25, 30 years ago. And it's interesting speaking to them what they need to do to try and educate their children. So the answer is that maybe those kids are looking to try and get away but mums and dads will have had some sort of experience one way or another themselves they're the ones responsible for giving the kids the right information yeah look you're right and you know i know one particular um, mother and she said i've done everything bad i know that could have been done so i know everything my daughters are potentially going to do so good education and i say and we've said this to our daughters i have three daughters do you know what? You know, when mum or dad gives you a, an aspirin or a pill, you take it, don't you? Yeah. And if the doctor says you need to take this little pill, you take it, don't you? Yeah. Is there anyone else you trust mm. to take a pill from? And they think about it for a moment in just that context. So whatever we are, we put into our mouths, food, booze and pills. We've got to be very careful and very vigilant. The other thing I didn't know in the Kingdom of Thailand, you have to be 20 years of age to be able to purchase alcohol legally. And a lot of young people visiting Thailand, particularly the 18, 19 year olds that will be coming over here for schoolies in October and November and December, they don't know that. Do we need the Thai authorities to say in Bangla Road, you need to be 20 years old to drink. Do we need to have those kind of sign warnings? Do we need more education at the airports? And these are some of the issues, I'm sure, on the PhuketNews.com, on the Facebook page, and Phuket News TV, I'm sure, will be covering these because I know the resources of the Seven Network Australia that I represent with it as Thailand correspondent. We're going to be looking at these issues over the next days, weeks, and months. Tim, it's been a pleasure speaking to you this afternoon. Thank you for joining me on Lifestyle. 
Uh, it's been a lot of fun. You, we can contact you. you. You're on Facebook as well. You can contact us through here at Class Out Media and also through the Seven Network Australia as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And uh, look, it is a great pleasure to have worked with you, Steve. I know that this week is your last week. I bid you a great and wonderful farewell for the future and hope that all your dreams come true for you and Kiranee. And thank you to all of our listeners that have taken the time to respond on Facebook. And you never know, I might be popping up every now and then here on Phuket's Live 89.5 FM uh, using the wonderful resources of the PhuketNews.com and, of course, 7 Network Australia. Why in the world would you watch anything else?